right. So as part of our unit on interpartner abuse and um, domestic relationship violence, I wanted to do a quick unit on something that I think needs a little more, bit more detail than what it's touched on in your textbook. And that is the relationship between pornography use and interpart interpartner domestic violence or IPD. Um, this is a topic of great both personal and professional advocacy for me. So one of the kind of beginning foundational ideas in discussing this link, because we have, I'm going to drop some links in the video if you want to fact check any of the articles or kind of see the details of them. But research is showing over and over and over again that there is a pretty strong link between the viewing of pornography, even if it's nonviolent pornography, which we'll get to in a minute why that's not really a genuine label, but between the viewing of pornography and the perpetuation of intimate partner violence. Um, this is an especially strong association when it comes to sexual abuse in an um, intimate partner relationship, but it is kind of widespread that can also affect verbal abuse and it can affect physical abuse. So one of the big overarching kind of ideas here, we're going to talk about some social ideas as well as some biological ideas. One of the big overarching ideas behind this relationship is that pornography dehumanizes women. And when someone is dehumanized, it's a lot easier to be violent towards them. When they're a tool, when they're an object, when they're a means to an end, it's easier for those types of violence to occur. And there's been a lot of research that has supported this idea that there's a significant correlation between an individual viewing sexually violent, violent pornography and also holding attitudes that support violence against women. So we know that there's an attitude link there, right? So what makes us go a step further to actually have it influence interpartner violent interpartner violence when it comes to sexual abuse and sexual assaults within relationships. Well, like I talked about earlier, the idea of nonviolent pornography is, is not really a fair label. Um, some of the different analyses that have been done, depending on what types of violence was being coded, the lowest number that was found was that one in three pieces of pornographic media contains some sort of expression of violence towards women. The highest number that's found is about nine in 10 pieces of pornographic media portray violence against women. And this is on researchers who were just randomly grabbing things like off of, um, I saw Pornhub mention a lot, obviously, and some of the other just free commonly used internet websites. The most common number that you see floating around is about 80%, about eight in 10 easily accessible pieces of pornographic media portray violence against women. And this involves violence that includes coercion, overriding consent, overpowering. She's saying, no, and he's not stopping things of that nature. And I want to take a quick stop and point out, I am using very uh, heteronormative language here and assuming that we are talking about male, female heterosexual relationships, because that's what most of the research has focused on. I'm not saying that the relationship between pornography and sexual violence does not exist for same sex couples. It's just that not as much research has been done on that. And so I want my language to be consistent with what the studies have found so that I'm not disingenuously representing the research. Um, so anyway, we, we know that the numbers are right around 80% of mainstream pornographic media is portraying sexual violence against women. And we know that there is a link between this then causing attitudes of supporting violence against women. Beyond the attitude, one interesting link that's been found is that those who have long-term exposure to pornography and have been found to be a sexual offender against a romantic partner, it leads the offender to minimize the severity of the violence and the acts that they commit. So for example, and I hope that none of you have ever had this experience because I know what this feels like. If you have been in a situation where there is sexual violence, and you're trying to go to therapy and work things out. And the offender is remaining stuck on the idea of, well, but I never beat you. I never gave you a black eye. I never broke a bone. I never pushed you down the stairs. I never actually like physically hurt you. 
So how are you using the word violence? How are you using the word abuse, right? That is something, that type of ideology is something that we often see with long-term pornographic exposure, right? Because it's been conditioning this attitude to support violence against women. And then it's also leading, for some reason, it's having this effect of minimizing the level of violence that they're perceiving sexual violence to be because it's made it so so mainstream and so common in what they're viewing. And we know that there's actual changes going on in the brain with these view with these viewings due to several neurobiological studies that have been done. I am going to very much simplify this in a way that I can understand it and explain it in a way that is accessible for a class that's not a biopsychology class. Um, we could get way more detail into this. And like I said, I'm dropping the links if you're if you're a biology person and you're wanting to get more into the brain anatomy here. But I'm gonna I'm gonna dumb this down for my own sake because biopsych is not one of my favorite divisions of our practice. Um, but in studies that have done fMRIs, there was one study that had found kind of three key brain changes when they did fMRIs among heavy pornography users who were male. The first thing that they found is that heavy porn use was related to having less gray matter in the striatum. And the striatum is the part of the brain that plays a role in the reward system. And it's been linked to motivation and decision making. And the way the authors had explained it is basically what happens is when you have less gray matter in your striatum, you're going to be less responsive to stimulation. And basically it's an indication that you've kind of like worn out your reward system. So you're less responsive to stimulation. This is going to become significant in just a minute. Another thing they found in that fMRI study is that those individuals had weaker brain response to sexual images. They had basically downregulated what their natural neuro response to a sexual stimuli would be, right? Because if you think about it, seeing your partner naked, undressed, in arousing clothing, whatever, there's supposed to be a sexual stimuli there, right? You're supposed to be aroused by your partner. You're supposed to be aroused by sexual imagery. But whenever you're consistently feeding that into your brain in more and more intensity, you're weakening your brain responding to that. And it makes sense, right, that you, you're you weakening your natural neural response uh, in your natural reward system to sexual stimuli, because if you've ever read about the, the correlation between people who view a lot of pornography tending to have problems with erectile dysfunction, tending to have problems with arousal and things of that nature, right, it makes sense because you're, you're conditioning it to need more and more and constant and constant, and you're, you're wearing down this natural brain response that you're supposed supposed to have for your sexual partner. The third big thing that's been found in the fMRI studies is that the brain circuitry, the brain connections, the brain communication between your prefrontal cortex, which is basically the, the decision making center of your brain, the brain circuitry between the prefrontal cortex and the reward system was reduced. Like that feedback loop wasn't operating the way that we typically see in a healthy adult. Now, whenever you have that sort of reduced functionality in that communication between the prefrontal cortex and the reward system in the brain, that has actually been linked in other studies to inappropriate behavioral choices, to a wearing down of the morality component of your decision making, if you will. So those are three ways that we know that pornography can change the brain, because those were actually like brain scan studies of pornography users. There's a really interesting theory happening right now about mirror neurons. What mirror neurons are is they're the parts of your brain that are active when you're performing an action while also observing somebody else doing that same action, right? So like if I go to a yoga class and I am mimicking the movements of my yoga instructor, I'm engaging my mirror neurons. I'm doing with my body the same thing that they're doing with their body. And that's kind of how I'm getting the, the muscle memory and the ability to know what my body should be doing. That's when you see mirror neurons happening. Um, so there's a really interesting current theory that's being researched about how mirror neurons could explain how we're going from pornography impacting the brain, which we know it does, to actually leading to an increase in violence in intimate partner relationships. Because what we see is, like I mentioned, the majority of pornographic material available out there has violent content in it. 
one thing that we know from brain scans is that when an individual is masturbating to pornography, the same part of their brain that is active when they're actually having sex with a partner becomes activated. So the way mirror neurons fit into this, again, if they're active, when I'm copying what I see somebody's doing, and in my brain, the part of my brain that would be active when I'm actually having sex with somebody is active when I'm watching this. What you are doing is in your brain, you are linking this action with the actions of violence that you are watching on the screen. You're programming violence into a part of that. And then you pair that with the fact that there's a lot of dopamine flooding your system to reinforce those pleasure pathways. And you're making that pairing in your brain while your neurotransmitters are reinforcing that pairing at the same time. And so there's a lot of researchers who believe that this effect that pornography can show an increased incident in interpartner violence, specifically interpartner sexual violence. There's a lot of researchers who believe we, we can actually explain this with brain structure and brain function. This isn't necessarily just a group of people making bad decisions. Like we can actually document brain changes that are happening. Um, so I, now I want to talk about what are some of the relationships we've actually seen between pornography and interpartner violence. I'll make that part two of this because part one already got kind of long. So part one is going to be kind of the background and the explanation for why it's happening. And then part two will be what is it that's happening? What are the numbers that we know?